And now the best part of the Traverse City Film Festival, a conversation with the people who made it all happen, the filmmakers. And joining me is Michael Weber. He is, uh, the, your, your baby is the elephant in the living room, right? That's true. That's actually a good way to put it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm so glad we're going to have this opportunity to talk about the film. I'm excited about it. It's an interesting topic. Yeah. Yeah. And for those of uh, poor people in the audience that haven't seen it, give us a, give us a little rundown. All right. Well, really, the film is about people who own exotic animals as pets and all across the country, and also the issue of exotic animals as pets across the United States. And so what we're talking about are people who own lions, tigers, you know, venomous snakes like puff adders, you know, uh, cobras. They keep in their homes or in their backyards, just like it were a dog or a cat. And they're raising them in the suburbs and rural areas in many you know, parts of the United States. So how did you ever fall upon this subject? And did you say, I gotta make a movie about this? Yeah, yeah I did. And I did kind of fall upon it. A friend of mine, uh, I, I've uh, produced several theatrical films and, and I've never done a documentary before, but I always wanted to. And a friend of mine had given me two books on the subject of exotic animals as pets. And those two books were written by a police officer in Ohio and basically his experiences over the past 30 years as he has dealt with, you know, someone calls in and says, hey, I just saw a tiger run through my backyard, or they see a strange snake in their garage, and, and it turns out to be a cobra. And uh, so, so he had written a couple books on the subject, uh, not just his experiences, but also what's going on nationally. And so I read those books, and I thought, this is incredible. And I actually didn't quite think that they could really be true. And so I had well, to meet the Well, that's what I'm, I'm <laughs> no. sitting here thinking, oh, come on, you're kidding, right. right? And I thought, too, maybe, well, this is just some really obscure, small subculture somewhere, just this guy's experience. And so I did meet him. And so his name is Tim Harrison. And once I, I, I did meet him and I talked about it uh, with him, I realized, well, this is even more amazing than, than I thought. And, uh, you know, he was cool. I, you know, he said, you know, don't take my word for it. You know, go out there and do some research for yourself. And so I did, and uh, I did that for about a year. So while making, you know, other films, in fact, I remember I was over in Poland uh, making a film and then finishing up another film in Los Angeles, this just kept working on me. And once I started paying attention and started looking into it, I realized this is the elephant in the living room. I mean, this is an enormous thing that's going on in this country, and no one seems to be talking about it, and no one seems to be aware that it's there. So I went back to the police officer and I said, look, um, I'd like to do a documentary on this. And, and would you be willing to, I'd like to follow you around for a few months and uh, tell your story and see some of your experiences. And uh, he was game for that. And so I did. And uh, you know, the interesting part is that three months ended up turning into a two year odyssey oh. of going all over the country, working with uh, owners of these animals and also still following his story and then you know, exploring all the issues relating to this uh, topic. Uh, it, it, it's frightening, isn't it? <laughs> it isn't it? Yeah, it it's actually, frightening it to is. think that, that, and people think that this is okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the other thing that really surprised me the most, I think, of, of all the, you know, how amazing you might think to have someone who has a lion that they keep in their backyard or, or a tiger that they raise in their house. But the real amazing thing to me were the laws. And there are no federal laws prohibiting anyone from owning an exotic animal like this. And so you're left you know, down to states. In about 30-some states, um, it's actually legal for you to own animals like this. Um, and they have laws regulating that. But there are about 10, 11, 12 states that actually have no state laws even. So there are many areas in this country where, well, I'll give you a perfect example. There's a character in my movie uh, who uh, is a man who owns two African lions that he keeps in his backyard as pets. And by the way, this isn't very obscure, by the way. So he does. Now, the interest, and I follow his story also for about a year or a year and a half and his experiences from the inside of owning animals like this and, um, and his situation and, and what he gets out of it, the ups and downs and so forth. So while I'm following the police officer, we're also following his story as well. Um, and the interesting thing is he has a couple dogs. He's got a Jack Russell Terrier. Well, he has to have a dog license from the county in order to own that Jack Russell, you know, have veterinary care, have shots, et cetera. But he doesn't have to have anything, no license, no shots, no one oversees his two African lions. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. 
That is, that is quite frightening. Right. And, and without giving away the end, because of course we don't want to do that. We sure, want everybody sure. to go see the movie, of course. <laughs> um, did, did you get attached to the animals? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I mean, you do. And, and, and you, actually for me, I mean, very quickly, really, um, you start to understand why it is that these owners become attached to the animals, why there's such a close connection between them. And what I found was they're actually, you know, so we have dogs and cats, you know, most of us. And you know that connection that you have you know, with these sort of domesticated animals that, that we keep as pets. What I found is with a lot of these owners is that you can multiply that by 10 with their lion, with their, believe it or not, even with their snake or with their cougar. And I, my analysis was that, I mean, they really see them as part of the family. If you have a chimpanzee, I mean, they will eat at the table, they will dress them and bathe with them. I mean, just like they would a child. And many of them literally, actually most of them call them their kid or their son. They say they're part of their family. And that connection is so much deeper that I found than we have with our domesticated animals. And I, I sometimes thought that it was because you have this big majestic creature. If I have a poodle right here and a tiger, you're not even going to notice that poodle over there. There's this big, amazing, domestic, wild animal. And when that thing connects with you, there's some kind of sort of spiritual bond that people have or just sort of fascination with this wild majestic creature connecting with me and they do they'll connect with their owner um, that is really unbreakable and, and and that actually makes the issue that much more difficult just in terms of even you know their inability to detach from what it is that they're doing are you taking a stand well the movie you know when I started off with this film um, I really didn't have a strong opinion on the subject um, the reason that I took it on was because the the topic is fascinating. Yeah. The characters are fascinating, and I really wanted to explore this. So, so I didn't come with an agenda. I'm a filmmaker. I look for interesting stories and characters that are in interesting situations, and, and that's what that was. But then having gone through it, and this is what happens through the film too, is you don't hear my voice. You don't hear my opinion. There's no narration. We basically will go and we'll follow these two opposite sides. You know, the police officer who is an advocate against people having this, and then the man who is an advocate you know, for keeping them, and he's actually doing that himself. And so we kind of follow those stories, and they will, what happens, happens, and the way that it ends, uh, it will end. And then you can kind of make up your own mind. And then we kind of contextualize it by showing different things that are going on all over the country as well. Sure. Um, but it did affect me. You know, when I came through the other end, um, I did have an opinion, you know, having experienced that uh, myself. And, and I was affected by it. And, and I felt quite differently about it, actually, you know, just six months into it than I did, than I did when I began. You're going well, to ask me. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. I want everybody to form their own opinion. I really do. I really do. Yeah. So we're not, no, we're not going to ask you. We're not going to ask you. We're not going to prejudice anybody. Let's, let's jump to another subject. Okay. 20 years in the business. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I started off, uh, I'd always been interested in film, just like every filmmaker, you know, as a child, you're always making, you know, movies and writing things. And, and a lot of my background, too, is in writing. Um, I would write screenplays, and, and I majored in English because I wanted to be a writer. And, uh, um, but I had ended up uh, uh, starting a production company with several other guys in Ohio. And uh, I mean, I've had that production company for 20 years and done a lot of uh, television and then commercial work. And um, several years back, I began producing motion pictures, and so I've produced uh, three films for 20th Century Fox and a film for Lionsgate. We have a film coming out this September, uh, again from Fox. And uh, these are, you know, uh, narrative films. Um, and so all of that experience, you know, so with the documentary, I think it brought all of this production experience and knowledge. Um, I also served as post-production supervisor and visual effects supervisor on all the other films and, and oversaw sound and music. And so that was a great asset when you do a documentary where you don't have big crews and everything. You, you serve many, many roles. And so that helped quite a bit uh, in making this film for me. What was your reaction when you found out that it was going to be here for the Traverse City Festival? <laughs> I was really excited. I had got an invitation from, from Michael's assistant to send the film. And I thought, wow, you know, uh, this is great. And you know what's so funny about that? And I mentioned it to my wife, and I said, boy, I would love to go, to go up there, but I don't know a lot about it. On our coffee table, I kid you not, was a travel book that she had, and highlighted in that book was Traverse City. 
And, she, and because she had actually been trying to get us, you know, work on a vacation for us to come up here because many of our friends knew about it and had been there. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And so unfortunately, I tried to keep my excitement down, you know, because uh, it's such a prestigious festival. And, and it's such a, you know, the selection of films here are just incredible. And I said, look, we probably will go visit there, but I'm sure it won't be with the festival. And so uh, when he got word back that they really, you know, enjoyed the film and, uh, and, and that we were invited to the festival, you know, I was just very excited and, and just so thrilled to be here and, and to experience it. We've talked to all the filmmakers about how difficult it is to get your film out there. Yeah, yeah. And it's just becoming more and more difficult. Um, do you ever feel like, oh, I just can't do it? Yeah, you know, it, it, filmmaking is so tricky because you have people who are artists making films. And artists, we don't like to think about the business side. We're, we're artists. That's a different side of the brain. We want to do our art. We want to tell our story. And the problem, you know, that, that you have in the movie business is that that word is attached to the end of it. It's the movie business. So it's hard to be a filmmaker without being in the movie business. So every film that you make, um, you know, it's actually a piece of commerce that you have to, to sell. And so that, so our other films in the past, I mean, we're raising... They're lower budget films, but we're raising $3 million to do that. We're raising $4 million, $2 million. And so the producer side of me, you know, comes in and you're always taking this thing that you want to be a piece of art that will entertain people, but you have to make a business out of it. And actually, honestly, that's really frustrating. Um, when it comes to the documentary, though, I look at it completely differently. You know, these are, for me, and the reason I took it on is because, and some of it was even out of frustration for having worked on commercial films, for lack of a better term, because it's like you, you as an artist, you want to do something. You do want to tell a story. You want it to be your own. Um, you don't want to have to fit it into all these spreadsheets you, and, and necessarily go out again and convince people to, to invest millions of dollars into something. And, and actually, the documentary allowed me to do that. And that's what I was excited about with, with taking on the documentary is I didn't have to do all of those things. It, it, it didn't have to make sense as a commercial enterprise. It only had to make sense to me. And I only had to have the ability, only I say, to do all the aspects of production that I had to do in order to make it. And I, and I actually was able uh, to do that. And the passion. And the passion. You know, that's that got to be there. has to be there. Well, you know, I, I had looked, you know, for so long for something like this to do for a documentary and I just couldn't find anything and so this was it because you know that when you do it you're going to be it's going to involve your family it's going to involve it's, it's it actually becomes part of your life and it still is and for two or three years it's just part of everything that I do you know this this documentary so it's completely different than the other uh, narrative films that I've, that I've worked on what's next uh, I have well I've kind of got the documentary bug you know it's been a a really good experience, and uh, I've really enjoyed it. And it's just been liberating, actually, uh, from a filmmaking standpoint, uh, to work on a documentary. Real people, real stories, and, and not to deal with all the things that we talked about. Um, and so I have several other documentaries that, that I'm developing right now that I'd like to pursue. And then, of course, uh, other uh, narrative films and, and studio pictures that are in development at different phases that we're ready to take on. So uh, lots of movies still to do after this. That's so nice to hear. That is wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. And remember, the film is called The Elephant in the Living Room. Look it up. Check it out. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You are Thank beautiful. you.